All right, so Jude, we are finishing Jude tonight. Uh, we have two verses to go through, so get ready. Uh, Jude 24 and 25, we are finishing our series on contending, and I'm super excited to share um, what God's put on my heart with all of you guys today, and I just hope that um, you'd lean into what Jude has to say to us and consider it. That's it. So here we go. First verse says... To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. First verse. Second verse says, To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. That's it. You guys good? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Before we get going... Again, you got uh, handouts on your way in here. You got pens in front of you. So make sure you take notes, uh, write down questions, comments, anything you might think of. But before you look back, I want to ask a question. Who remembers JD's three points from last week? Who remembers the first one? Anyone? Don't look back. Don't cheat. I heard you flip the page. Anyone? First thing we do. Build yourself up. Thank you, Braley. Build yourself up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, right? Lean into, I know she cheated. Lean into <laughs> your deepening understanding for God and who he is, who his character is. Okay, second thing is what? Keep yourselves in the love of good. Thank you. Keep yourselves. Remember the grace that you've been shown. Yeah? Strengthen your faith. And the last one, who's got it? Come on, this is the fun one. What is it, J.D.? Show. 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 Show mercy. Use your life to show mercy. And I bring these things up because I, I think that Jude's closing two verses are his, him giving us a demonstration of that. So I bring that up because I think it's important. Okay? Here we go. Here's the, here's the rest of it. First things first. Anyone know what these last two verses are? In my Bible, I had a little title above them. Anyone know what that is? Doxology. Do you guys know what that is? Good, me neither. Here we go. A liturgical formula or pr of praise to God or an expression of praise to God. I don't like the liturgical thing. That seems very religious and whatnot. Um, and I like to think about God in a very practical sense and who he is and his character and things like that. So I want to bring this idea of doxology back to like a ground floor level for us so we can move from there. So, an expression of praise to God, which got me thinking, well, what is praise? How do I praise God? Right? So, I'm thinking practically again. I, I, JD, as he often does, stumbles into my brain. And I thought about if I were JD and I had Baylor, and Baylor did something I really liked, I would praise her, right? I would say, oh, that's so good. Good job. That's praise, isn't it? J.D. is coming into alignment with what, with what his daughter has done and acknowledging that it's good, that it's right. Get what I'm going for? Same thing as a teacher. I was a teacher. I was a coach. When players and students did what I expected, I was able to praise them because they came into alignment with what I expected. So that's from top down. But the same is true going from down up. We can praise parents, we can praise teachers, we can praise coaches when we come into alignment with who they are and what they say, what's good and true and right about them. Yes? I think that's what our praise to God is. Our praise to God is when we come into alignment with the character, the truths of who God is. That's true praise. Do I agree with what the Bible says about God? If I do, I'm praising him, right? I think that makes it, um, at least for me, a little bit more graspable. Praise is this big idea sometimes, and I want it to be really real for us that for me to truly praise God, what I need to do is recognize who he is. Build my faith so that I can come into alignment with what the Bible says about God and who he is. And my praise directly leads into my... Maybe the next slide will give us the answer. My worship. 
I'm convinced that when we praise things automatically, we start to worship them. When we come into alignment with things or people and acknowledge that they are good, we start to worship them. And again, I think worship is is a big term that we like to use in church, but I want to bring it down to a ground floor level and say, what is worship? Right? What is it? What does it mean? So to honor, show reverence for, to regard with great extravag- or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. And if you're like me at all, you didn't get either of those definitions. They flew right over your head. You're like, what is, okay, what does it mean to worship? So I started thinking. You can go to my next slide. I said, who have I worshipped in my life? I think that's a good place for us to start when trying to understand what worship really is. Right? Oh, I got my slides out of order in my brain. Um, Kyle Eidelman wrote a book called Gods at War. If you haven't read it, it's um, phenomenal. It's, It's about idols in worship. And he says this about worship. He says, when you subtract religious language, worship is the built-in human reflex to put your hope in something or someone and then chase after it. You hold something up and then give your life to pursuing it. And I don't think Kyle Eidelman is um, out on his own with this definition, right? There's scripture to back up what he's saying. So Romans 12.1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy... To offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So both Kyle and Paul are saying that our worship reflects around our life. And what does our life chase after? What is our life pursuing? And I think that directly lines up with the things that we praise. So what we praise, we worship. And what we worship, we start to look like. Following me? I've got a better example for you. This is the slide I thought we were going to. So I asked myself, who did I worship? Sorry, that's really small. It says, who did I worship? Did, did. This is past tense, right? So I grew up in Columbus. Um, I played soccer my whole life, pretty much. And uh, you guys might not know this guy, but this was my idol. This is who I wanted to be. His name's Brian McBride. He played for the Columbus crew, he's from St. Louis, played in Germany, came back to Columbus, Um, and he's who I wanted to be as a kid. I I wanted to be him, I worshiped him, he was my idol. Uh, I wanted to look like him, I wanted to dress like him, I wanted to wear the things he wore, I wanted to be Brian McBride, okay? Oh, one back, one back, one back. There we go. So you can see, I'm not lying. I, you, that's why you all laughed while I was looking this way. I wanted to be him. If you look close enough in the image on the right, I'm pretty sure I had a shoelace in my hair. Um, you can't really see it there, but I'm pretty convinced that I was coming home from practice and I had a shoelace tied to keep my hair out of my eyes because that's how long it was. And clearly I haven't gone far away from the whole hair thing. Okay, so... so This was my idol. This is who I wanted to be. And idols are interesting. I think we all have them. I know we all have them. And normally, they're really far away from us. Those things we want, those things we idolize, those things we make our life after, chase after, are really far away. We can't touch them. We can't grasp them. We can't interact with them, right? Well, for me, I had a really awesome experience. And now you can go to the next one. So this is me walking out of um, the Horseshoe locker room, Ohio Stadium's locker room. In 1996, the crew played at uh, Ohio Stadium. And if you look really hard, right behind me is is my mom. My mom was the athletic trainer for the Columbus crew, which means I had really intimate access to my idol. Really intimate, to the point where we were out at dinner one night when I was seven, maybe, seven or eight, and I was tired and I was a child, so I fell asleep at dinner. And my idol carried me out of the restaurant. That's the, that's the intimacy that I had with my idol, right? I had a very different type of relationship with him to the point where when I wanted things, when I wanted to look like him, I could bug him to get them. To the point where he gave me a pair of cleats 
because I wanted to wear the ones he had. And I want to contend with you that that relationship with an idol is available to all of us in Jesus. That intimacy, that ability for us to poke and pester and prod and say, God, I really want this. I don't know if he'll give it to you. But that ability to have that type of intimacy with an idol is available to all of us. Okay, so the first thing I want to, I want to, first point I want to make is that what we praise, I praise Brian McBride, is what we worship. What we worship, we start to look like. And I want to ask you and, and have you consider what you're worshiping. And it might be the next, next slide. Who, what do I worship? And the next slide says, what is the doxology of my life? We talked about the doxology as this expression of praise. What am I praising in my life? What am I praising that's leading to my worship with my life that is changing what I look like, how I move through the world? What is it? Right? And I'd argue that, next slide, I hope, that that thing if it's not God, is an idol. That book, uh, God's at War, Kyle Eidelman talks about idols, and he says that we don't have a sin problem in the world. We have an idolatry problem. If you think back to uh, Ten Commandments, the first one says, have no other God before me. And that before me doesn't mean like it's a race, like that other idol can come in second. It means in my presence, have no other idol in my presence. And what we do as people is we make idols out of things. Things. And in ancient time, it was really easy to see because when the Israelites were enslaved in, in Egypt, especially, Egypt itself had gods, multiple gods, gods in every district for that little neighborhood. They had gods of the sun and the rain and the weather and the this and the that and the, Theology, deities were real. Yeah? Following? But now, we don't talk like that. But I promise you, those gods are still here. It could be our job. It could be a relationship. It could be our family. It could be, you name it, money. Uh, the, the list is endless of the things that we can idolize. But we don't call them gods anymore. But they are. They are, if we place them in the spot where Jesus goes, right? Only Jesus is, is reserved for that top spot in our life, okay? So let's get into, with all that in mind, actually the text, I think. So Jude says, to him who is able to keep you from falling, and I think this is really cool, the idea that, um, who's him in this? Anyone got a guess? Thank you. To Jesus, who is able to keep you from falling. So I got two kind of thought bubbles with this. First and foremost, Jesus is able to keep us falling. He's not saying like, oh, he's interested in it. He might. He's saying that, or he's capable of it. He's saying that when we come into a relationship with Jesus, we don't become robots. We don't become these automated beings who just do what God says we should do. That's not how God created us. We still have autonomy. We still have choices to make. So the able means that we are a part of this process. We get to grow with God. We get to move with him. He's not just sticking his finger on us and saying, you're going to do this now, now that you're mine. That's not God. That's not the characteristics that we know of him. He's saying, to him who is able, he can keep you, but you have to receive. You have to put yourself in the posture for him to keep you. And that brings me into my next point is him who is able. Jesus is able to keep us from stumbling. And there are a lot of things. I just mentioned some with the ideas of idols. There are a lot of things that are unable to keep us from falling and stumbling. If you're anything like me, I've experienced a few of them, right? 
I've failed at jobs. I've failed at relationships. I've failed at sports. I've failed at all of these things that I've tried to find my identity in, these idols in my life, and they've all failed. I've left, no matter how far I got in that thing, I've left unfulfilled. And it's only through recognizing who is able to keep me that I've been able to become at peace with the reality of the world around me. Okay? He goes on, he says, to present you before his glorious present without fault and with great joy. You guys, this is crazy. J.D. mentioned it. J.D. gave you guys all my points before when he was up here praying. Uh -uh. So bear with me. But this next part here where he says, Jesus is going to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. You guys, Jesus, God, Jesus Christ, who came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on a cross for our sins as God, resurrected, and when we believe in him, gives us eternal life. Yes, that guy, that perfect being is going to take me when I die and present me before God with what? One, without fault, and two, with you guys. Great joy? Are you kidding me? Jesus is joyful to present me to God? I'm telling you what, guys, if that doesn't that doesn't move your heart in, in some direction. Whew. Without fault. Obviously, what Christ did on the cross paid for my sins when I believed. So all of that is wiped away. And now there's only joy for Jesus to present me to God with. And not only joy, but he says this. He says in Ephesians 1, 18, right, J.D.? Yep. I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. He's saying that we are Jesus' glorious inheritance. I told you J.D. gave this all away earlier. But the reality of the fact is that as much as we revel in the fact that Jesus is our inheritance and that we have eternal life in him, we are his inheritance. We are the thing that he gets to bring home at the end of everything and say, look at what I have. Me. You guys, me. I tell you what, J.D. talks a lot about mercy and grace last week and um, just reflecting on that right here, like, that's grace. That's mercy. Because I know my past. I know my history. And I do not deserve to be presented in front of a holy God. But not only am I going to be presented, I'm going to be presented with joy as an inheritance. Whew. That's, I mean, <laughs> that's some good news, guys. So, again, thinking back to J.D., build your faith. Know his character. Remind yourself, keep yourself in the love of God. Reflect on his grace. And what is it going to do? It's going to move our hearts in the direction so that we can show. All right. Next slide, please. It says, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages now and forevermore. And um, this idea I've, I've wrestled with all week, and I'm like, okay, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority. Like, what are we trying to say? Like, yes, coming into alignment with who God is. God is glorious. God is, God is majesty, right? God has power. God has authority. And J.D. and I were talking about it, and I, I needed some wisdom, so obviously I asked J.D., and um, he helped me kind of put this into alignment. He's saying, when do you see glory in your life? When do you see God's majesty in your life? When do you see God's power in your life? And I'm going to ask you one more question before I tell you the answer. Okay. If you go all the way back to the beginning of Jude, Jude starts it with, Jude, a what? A servant, a slave, right? And my point being of that was what? What do we have to do? You get an A. Brilliant. We keep things in order, okay? 
what I think when I think about this verse, glory, majesty, power, when I see and experience those things in my life, it's because I've placed Jesus in the authority position of my life. I've kept things in order, and I've said, okay, God, I don't want to do this, or I do want to do this, and it doesn't line up with what you're calling me to do. But I recognize your authority, and I will submit. I will be a slave. You know what happens? We see glory, we see majesty, and we see power manifest in our life. It might not be the way you expect, but I promise you, you will feel the love and the glory and all of these things building in your life as you put things in their proper place. Okay. Next part here, he says, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. And um, again, I think this whole doxology, this whole praise if we think back to what I tried to define praise as, is us coming into alignment with a character of a person or a thing, right? And this whole thing has been Jude aligning himself with truths and reality of who God is. God is before all ages, he is now, and he is forevermore. And it's like, okay, Colin, we know that, thanks. So what? I think it's important for us to recognize and remember that when Jesus died on the cross, and offered us salvation, and we received it, he wasn't just in that moment. He was beyond that moment, too. He knows, he knew when he gave you salvation, when he offered it to you, that you would fail him again, just like I have. We will fail Jesus again. And sometimes we think, oh, well, God, God's going to be mad at me about that. I, I'm in this thing. I'm supposed to be good. I'm supposed to be clean. I'm supposed to be all these things. Right? And as we reflect and as we do what Jude's telling us to do, we move towards that 100%. But God knew when he offered you salvation on that cross and you received it, he knew when he gave it to you that you would fail him. And I don't know about you, but when I reflect on that truth, it makes me feel better because God knows we're not going to be perfect from here on out. And he still offered the gift. He could have said, you know what? I know you're going to fail. I'm not going to give you this. You don't deserve it. It's not worth my time. But he didn't. He says, I know who you are. I know what's going to happen. I know you're going to fail me. And still, I love you. Still, I'm willing to give you this gift of salvation, regardless of how your heart feels towards me. You guys, that's a love that is not from this world. And I would just hope and pray that if you haven't heard who Jesus is or you haven't heard the gospel or you haven't received that gift yet, I just pray right now that you would receive it and you would open your heart to, to hear from God because that gift is life-changing. That love is life-changing. And, and that's what we have to offer when we look like Jesus. Okay, so I don't, did I give you point two? I probably skipped over it. Anyone hear point two? Point two was back talking about, um, I don't know, I'll just show you. It's easier that way for me. All right, here we go, next slide. How do we contend? Oh, look how small that was. It didn't get shown up, or it didn't pull upright. How do we contend? So I got three things for you here. The first one is what? What's the, what was the one I gave you? I know I gave you one. You guys remember two weeks ago last week, but not this one? I gave you one. First thing, we're talking about doxology and praise and worship and all that. Anyone remember? Come on, you're supposed to write it down. That's why you got pencils and papers and all these things. Yeah. What we praise, we worship, and what we worship, we look like. Point number one. What we praise, what we come into alignment with, the character of the things that we choose to follow, we start to worship. We put it up high in our lives. We put it above Jesus sometimes if it's not appropriate, Right? And what we praise, what we worship, affects our heart. And it affects what we look like. That's what changes us. What we praise is what we, or what we worship is what we praise, and what we worship is what we look like. Okay, point number two, the one I didn't tell you, you'll just put it up here because I forgot. There's only one Abel. But I didn't tell you it was point number two, did I? So that's on me. Point number two, only one is Abel. 
He who is able to keep you from falling and stumbling. We've all experienced the things that are unable. And I hope that we can all take the one that is and put them in the throne. Put him in the throne. Yes, there's only one that's able to save and to keep us from falling, and that's Jesus. Okay, point number three, last one here. The choice is ours. I didn't tell you this one either because I was trying to remember point number two. The choice is ours. Thinking about where we place Jesus. Do I recognize his authority in my life? Do I accept his authority in my life? Am I allowing his authority to shape my life? I don't know. But what comes from that? Majesty, glory, power. There's only one that's able to save. And the choice is ours of what that thing is. The choice is ours of what idol that gets to be in the top position of our life. And I hope, like you have experienced, that Jesus is the only one that fulfills.